Hello everyone, let's start our lecture. So in the previous lecture, we talked about antenna arrays. So that was the topic in the previous lecture, antenna array. And in particular, to start our discussion, we talked about two element antenna array. And for two element antenna array, we show, we show that we have a concept of array factor. So we had array factor which we called it AF. And this array factor was independent of the type of the antenna that's involved. For example, we mentioned if we have two dipole antenna uh, versus two, for example, loop antenna, or if we change the, uh, the, the orientation of the dipole, array factor stays the same as long as the separation between the antenna elements are the same. And also the phase that we excite the antenna with would stay the same. So, so this is this is what we discussed in the previous lecture, and then we derived the array factor for these uh, special cases, and we also showed that with change of the phase, you can change the pattern. Perhaps most importantly, we said that the radiation pattern of the whole array, if let's say, for example, the E, the electric field of the whole array, would be equal to E of a single element multiplied by the array factor. And for that single element, we have it placed at the center of the array, and also we have the phase of zero for that element. So uh, this, of course, we assumed uh, that the, all the antenna elements are the same thing. For example, all of them are dipole, all of them are loop and things like that. And we also ignored mutual coupling between the antenna elements, because if there are mutual coupling between the antenna elements, for example, the current on one affect the current on the other one, then things get more complicated. So it's good to design it with this mechanism and then in a, in a simulation software, for example, the one that we are using in our simulation lab, then we can take into account these type of things as well. So now in this lecture, we're gonna generalize the topic that we discussed in the previous lecture. So I'm gonna go essentially to N element, so in instead of two elements, we're going to have now n element, and we're going to have linear uniform antenna array. So as you see, the generalization in particular is this n element. So for ex if I want to describe that, so let's have our coordinate. For example, let's say this is y, this is z. Let's assume the elements are on the z axis. So these are my elements, essentially. And then they go, and then I get to this element. So this is element one, element two, element three, element four, element five, and so on. So if I have a situation like this, then essentially this is linear because the elements are on a line. So this is the term linear. In terms of uniform, the separation between all the elements are the same. For example, this separation is D, this is D, this is D, and so on for the rest of the element. I shouldn't say five here because I'm assuming that there are, there could be many elements here. So this is element number N. So from four to uh, whatever your element is, element number N. And so this is part of the uniform. And the other thing is essentially the current distribution. So in general, because we are dealing with phase or we have magnitude and phase. So the magnitude of all of them are assumed to be the same thing. So let's call them I. So this is current I, this is current I, this is current I. So, so far, this uniform separation and also the same magnitude as is part of the definition uniform. The other thing that's part of this definition uniform is the phase. So for the first one, let's say we assume phase of zero. So it's going to be e to the power of j zero and e to the power of j zero is one. So you can just say nothing, just i. And then the next one, we're going to have a phase difference of beta. So J beta. And for the next one, we're gonna have a phase difference of beta compared to this. So we call it progressive phase shift of beta, e to the power of J two beta. Now this one is gonna have a beta phase difference with respect to this one, 
j3 beta and note that this is element 4 and this is 3 beta so if we keep going we're going to get to e to the power of j n minus 1 beta so as you see linear because they are on a line uniform because separations are the same magnitude are the same and the phase you're going to have a progressive phase shift of beta for all of them with respect to the previous element note that 3 beta minus 2 beta is still beta 2 beta minus beta is still beta so this is the this is the definition of this antenna array now we our purpose here is to find the array factor for this system so if I want to find an array factor, you may think that I need to have an antenna here. But remember that I actually don't have any, any antenna. I, I showed my antenna by a point. The reason is that, as you learned in the previous lecture, array factor doesn't depend on the particular antenna type that you're choosing. So I could choose any antenna that I want and then write the electric field. And then final expression, I can, ex I can decompose it into two terms. One term would be single antenna element, and the other one would be the array factor. So if I, for example, choose a dipole here, then E total would be E of dipole, single element, multiplied by array factor. So I remove that from my final expression, and I have my array factor. So if you have a situation like this, we may say, okay, let's choose the simplest possible antenna. And we, for that, I think the simplest would be the hypothetical antenna that we have, which is essentially an isotropic antenna that essentially radiates everywhere the same, because then we don't need to deal with very, uh, um, might be a complicated E for single antenna element, depending on the one that you're choosing. So I can assume that all of them is isotropic. So if I go by isotropic, then for isotropic, the, the the single element is of the form of e to the power of minus jkr divided by r. So as you see, I have a phase term that's propagating outward in the r, direct, r direction, and I have one divided by r because I have this spherical expansion. So I can assume that each of them has an electric field in this form, for example, for now. And then when I get my final expression, I just ignore this part, and then I have my array factor so let's do that and then see what we're going to get so so i need an observation point and of course my observation point would be in the far field for example so uh, this is going to be let's call this r1 let's call this r2 let's call this r3 let's call this r4 R4 and let's call this Rn. So these are the distances to the observation point that I have. So what would be the field of this antenna in the far, assuming that this is isotropic? I can just say it's going to be e to the power of minus jk R1 divided by R1. What would be the field of this one? Based on the same equation, I can just say R2. So e to the power of minus jk R2 divided by r2 and i go continue until i get to my last one rn divided by rn so this is the expression that i have for the superposition of fields at my observation point now as you know the denominator is not very sensitive so i can actually approximate all of them with just r and remember this r1 here is in fact r because if you connect from the center of the origin to uh, to the observation point, that's R in a spherical coordinate. So I can essentially say all the denominator, this one, this one, until this one, are all R because they're all a magnitude. But then for the phase, the situation is different and you want to be more accurate. And we learned that more accurate essentially means when you are dealing with r2 you can just write r2 in terms of r1 which is r but then you're gonna subtract this a small portion from it and you learned from uh, your uh, the previous lecture that this a small portion here is in fact d which is this distance times cos theta remember this is theta here so it, you can just say d cos theta so the first one would be 
R minus D cos theta here. So instead of that R, sorry, instead of that R2 here. So let's let's write that again. So for the first term, we're just gonna write e to the power of minus J K R R because this R1 for the first one is the same as R. For the second term, we're gonna keep the R, but then for R2, which is in the phase term here, because remember, K is the wave number. So you're comparing your R2 with wavelengths, which can be very small. So then you say, okay, my R2 from here to here is the same as R1 minus this tiny distance here. So think of this triangle here. So to make it clear for you, let me have a zoom version. This is my R. This is my R2. So I'm saying R2 is the same as R minus this distance. And this is D. This is theta. So this is D cos theta. So I'm assuming this is the same as this. So that's the, that's a better approximation that I'm using compared to saying R2 is the same as R that I'm using in the denominator. So for the phase term, I'll, I'll do a one a step better approximation. So then uh, here in terms for minus JK R2, I'm just gonna write e to the power of minus JK R minus D cos theta. So that would be my uh, second one. And then I can just keep going. I can just say plus e to the power of minus jk. Now for r3, which I don't have it here, it's going to be exactly the same. But this time, remember, I need to subtract. So I need to consider this triangle here. So I'm going to have r3 is the same as r minus 2d cos theta. So it's going to be r minus 2d cos theta divided by r. So that's going to be my r3 this time. And then when I go to Rn, I'm going to end up having, so if I was on R3, I had 2D cos theta. This was R3. So I had two of these D projected on R. So it was 2D cos theta. So naturally, if I go to N, I'm going to have N minus 1D instead of these two. So I'm going to have N minus 1D cos theta divided by r. So that would be the superposition of all the fields that I have. If you pay attention here, you see that I've missed one thing. So this is essentially my uh, isotropic source. And then the difference between these isotropic sources is that they're located at different distances. So if you look at the phase, you get a phase difference between all of them. So for example, let's compare this one with this one. This one is e to the power of minus jkr. This one is e to the power of minus jkr plus e to the power of jkd cos theta. In our convention, plus means you have a phase lead. So essentially, this one, the effect of this one is going to arrive sooner here because essentially this is closer. But I forgot about one thing, and this is the electric phase that I have. This is all due to a space distances, but also I'm exciting them with different currents. So the first one had a current of I, so this one has a current of I. The second one is the current of I, if you remember, magnitude is the same, but now I have a phase difference due to electric excitation. So this is I e to the power of J beta times that. The third one, the same story, it's going to be i e to the power of j2 beta. Remember that the phase can be anything you want. Just because it's uniform, we are limiting ourselves to uniform, the phases are progressive phase with the phase difference of beta. And naturally, for the last one, and we have many before that, of course, for the la last one, we're going to have i e to the power of j n minus 1 beta. So this is what we're gonna have when when we have uh, when we have the summation. Now, if you look at the summation that we get, we have the signature of the antenna, which is e to the power of minus jkr divided by r. 
This is the isotropic the source that we chose. We have the signature of excitation, which is this beta, and we have the signature of geometry, which is this distance d that we have between the elements. Now, if that's my, it's if that's my. Uh, so the total effect, the superposition, I can actually factor e to the power of minus j k r, and uh, and then and then write the remaining and see what's going to happen. So let me do that here, and uh, I can I can perhaps remove this so that I can just write it side by side so that you can see it better. Okay, so. If I start factoring the single antenna element, a single antenna element is what this one, the first antenna that we started with, which is i e to the power of minus j k r divided by r. So this is the single element. If I factor that, I get one for this one. And for the next one, I'm going to get e to the power of j beta. I mean, to be consistent with the node, let me first write this one, kd cos theta plus beta. So this is what remains here after I factor this. Now, if I go to the next element, it's going to be plus e to the power of j. And now I have a factor 2 here and also 2 here. So it's going to be 2 kd cos theta plus beta. And then I can just keep going. Let's say for the third one, which is actually the fourth one here, one, two, three, four, but then I have a factor of three, then kd cos theta plus beta, and then for the very last one, I'm going to get e to the power of j n minus one kd cos theta plus beta. So this is essentially the superposition of all the fields. Now, if I ask you, what is the array factor here? You say, okay, this was my single antenna element, of course. This was my isotropic source that I had. And then the remaining is my array factor. So now I just have the array factor for uh, my, my system. And this is this summation. So if I want to, if I want to write that in a better way, the convention that our textbook uses is that to represent this by, let's say, psi. So if I do that, then it becomes 1 plus ej psi, ej2 psi, ej3 psi, ejn minus 1 psi. So that becomes our array factor. And we just ignore this because this was for the antenna element that we started with, which was isotropic. I could have done the same thing with a dipole. Then here I had the field of dipole but because i i didn't care about this part i just wanted inside the bracket i chose the simplest one which is which is this this case so now let me write my array factor which is from here to here on this side so if i do that then i get my array factor to be 1 plus e to the power of j psi plus e to the power of j 2 psi plus e to the power of j n minus 1 psi. So this becomes my array factor and where psi is kd cos theta plus beta. So now, if you if you look at this array factor expression, uh, we're gonna, by the way, simplify this to a to an expression that's easier to work with because this have summation of many terms. But although we can simplify this, and I'll do that for you, but I prefer this expression for understanding. If you look at this expression, you realize something. But before talking about that, let's check psi. What is this psi? Psi is essentially our phase shift or phase difference. So this is a phase. What, the, what is the beta? This is also phase, but due to electric excitation. So I'm going to say excitation. So I'm going to say electric because you usually use phase shifter or transmission line to create phase difference beta between elements. But then kd cos theta, 
is the phase difference due to different distances. So it, it, it is due to a space. So this is phase difference due to the ge due to geometry, essentially. A space. So, so remember, if you have two points here, and this one is, let's say, uh, R2, I, I plot it better. So let's assume this is far field. This is R2. This is R1. So if I if I say R2 is R1 minus D cos theta, and this is D, this is theta in the phase there. If so, the the change is D cos theta essentially between these two. Now, if you want to know how much phase difference you're gonna get here for the electric field remember that you always multiply the, the distance which is the difference between these two by the wave number so wave number times distance is going to give you the phase change that's happening at the observation point and it makes sense because remember this is in meter and k is 2 pi divided by lambda so this is of course in radian and lambda is meter so meter and meter cancel and you end up with an angle that shows the phase difference in terms of radian. So if you think of k 2 pi divided by lambda, you can easily see why multiplication of this result in the phase difference. So that's our psi. So essentially, psi adds up the two sources of phase difference, electric and space. Now, for each of the antenna, we have, a, we have a different psi, of course, but the size are completely related. Of course, for the first one, because that was our reference, it is one. So everything, I mean, we, 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 ch we check everything with respect to the first one here. And then the second one, we had a separation of D and a phase of beta. So that's why I have only one psi. For the second one, uh, or I should say for the third one here, I had a 2D separation. So that's why I have a two here, and I have the phase of two beta. For the very last one, the nth element, we had the, the phase of n minus one beta due to electric, and also the separation with respect to the very first element was n minus one d, and so that's why we have it here. So as you look at array factor, this is essentially the collection of phase differences. So essentially, you're summing up the effect of all of them, and summing up is because of superposition, and each of them is going to be different with some phase due to these two sources of phase difference. So that's my array factor, and I hope that I made it clear for you what it means there. Now, if I change my antenna to dipole antenna, you have a single element dipole multiplied by this array factor. But as I mentioned, this array factor might be a little bit difficult to work with, because you have a summation that goes to uh, the final uh, antenna and that can be long. So we're gonna simplify that. And to simplify that, it's just a mathematical procedure. So to do that, I'm just gonna multiply both sides by e to the power of j psi. So I'm going to say, okay, let's multiply both sides by e to the power of j psi, and that's going to become e to the power of j psi plus e to the power of j 2 psi, and then I go all the way, and if I have, if you consider one term before that, that's n minus 2, and if I multiply by e to the power of j psi, that becomes e to the power of j n minus one psi. So this, this term here is for one term previous to this. And the last term here becomes e to the power of j n psi, because n minus one times e to the power of j psi becomes e to the power of j n psi. So essentially, I what I did was I multiply this by e to the power of j psi, and this is what I get. The first term becomes that, the last term becomes this. So this is my array factor. Now I'll do a, a one a small trick here. I'm just gonna add a one here. So I'm just gonna say one plus, so I'm adding this one, and therefore I'm gonna subtract it from here to cancel is this its effect. So 
one plus here and then minus one. But as soon as I do that, you realize something that this part is again my array factor based on this definition. So essentially I can write that e to the power of j psi array factor is equal to this term, which is array factor plus e to the power of j n psi minus one. So this is the trick that I did. And you see that with this trick, I got rid of these long summation because I said, okay, this is just my array factor. Then you can factor array factor here, and that's gonna be e to the power of j psi minus one equal e to the power of j n psi minus one. And therefore your array factor becomes e to the power of j n psi minus one e to the power of j psi minus one. So this is essentially the simplified version of this. But as you see, although I simplified, but I somehow lost the meaning here because this was very beautiful. You just add the phase terms here, but this one you've lost really the meaning here, but then you simplified it. Now, if you want to do even a, to do a better job here, you could do one extra step here and that's, and that's going to essentially make things a little bit easier for you. So you can just write that as e to the power of j n psi divided by 2, then e to the power of j n psi divided by 2 minus this. So this is for the numerator. I just factor n psi divided by 2, and I get that. And for the denominator, I do a similar thing, but this time psi divided by 2. Therefore, it becomes j psi divided by 2 minus j psi divided by 2. So this is the trick that I have done. And then I can simplify that even further. So it's going to be n minus 1 psi divided by 2. And then if you remember the numerator, you can write it as 2j sine n psi divided by 2. Remember that e to the power of j theta minus minus j theta is 2j sine theta. So I'm using that identity. So it's going to be 2j sine n psi divided by 2 divided by 2j sine psi divided by 2. 2j and 2j cancel. It becomes j n minus 1 psi divided by 2 sine n psi divided by 2, sine psi divided by 2. So this becomes my array factor. Now, this is nice because I have two sine terms divided by each other, and I want to remind you that psi is a still uh, consists of two terms, a phase due to a space, phase to excitation. So this is my uh, term here, and then I can just say this is my array factor. So let me write that as my array factor. So, but I can even do better simplification. And to do that, let me remind you of our the structure of our array. So in our array, we started by saying that this is i, e, j, zero, and then this is i, e, j, beta, and then we went up until we arrived at i, e, j, n minus 1 beta. So as you see, this was the phase reference. This was the phase reference because it has a phase of 0. And that's why we have essentially this term. And if you look at this term, this is essentially the phase at the center of the array. But if we do simplification in a way that always we assume that the phase reference, phase of 0, is at the center of the array, then this term would be completely gone. Now, because we are free in choosing our phase reference, what we call phase of zero is up to us. Everything would be associated with that. If I want to make you an example, let's consider my previous lecture. In my previous lecture, I said this antenna is i e to the power of minus j beta divided by 2. This is i e j beta divided by 2. So you see, the way that I presented in the previous lecture, 
this one was minus beta divided by two. This was plus beta divided by two. So this was my phase of zero at the center. So this is minus beta divided by two. This is beta divided by two, and this was phase of zero. So in the previous uh, lectures, I had them in a way that at the center, I get my phase of zero. So if you do that, because you are free to do that, phase is just the reference point, then this term would be gone. So you don't have this term anymore. So this term would be gone. And then your array factor will be simplified to sine n psi divided by 2, sine psi divided by 2, where psi is kd cos theta plus beta. Now, we had the array factor for this one in the previous lecture, let's let's make sure that this is going to give us the same expression. So let, let's check that and see if we can get the same thing from uh, this equation. So now, for the in the previous lecture, we had two antennas. So n is two. So I can just substitute two here. So I'm going to have array factor is going to become sine 2 psi divided by 2, which is sine psi. And this is sine psi divided by 2. And you can just use the equation that sine of psi is 2 sine psi divided by 2 cos psi divided by 2 divided by sine psi divided by 2. And you're going to get to cos psi divided by 2. Substitute for psi, you get 2 cos kd cos theta plus beta divided by 2. And that's exactly what we get in the previous lecture for the array factor of this one. So we just verify that this equation is in fact correct and can give us uh, uh, the right answer for two element antenna array. Something else that you can see here is that, I mean, this, this equation it's, it's very, I mean, it's hard to see the concept here, whereas in this one, it's easier to see. But at least when you simplify this equation to get to this for the two element antenna array, you see that the maximum of array factor is two because the maximum of cos is one. So the maximum is two. And that essentially means if you have two elements, best case scenario, they're going to add in phase. And if they add in phase, you get twice the effect. And here, you see that better because in this situation, remember that the maximum of this is going to be n because you have n terms and you know that the magnitude of e to the power of j anything is 1. So the maximum magnitude of this is 1. So if they all add in phase, you get capital N as final answer. And here we have the same uh, confirmation that for two elements, we get the maximum of two. Now, so if I ask you, what is the maximum of array factor in general, and let's use this one, then how could you answer this? What is the maximum of this? So conceptually, you know that if you have n elements, then the best case scenario is that all of them add in phase, and then you get the maximum. If you have n elements, so if all of them add in phase, you get capital N, and that would be essentially the maximum of array factor. And you can see that from here too, that if the, uh, essentially magnitude of e to the power of j psi is one, but these ones would be added in phase if, the, if, if all the elements add up in phase. But let's check that from mathematics here. So the maximum of this happens when all the elements are in phase, and phase is determined by psi. So if psi, all of them essentially give you, let's say, the same psi, for example, psi of zero, all of them have psi of zero, then let's see what's going to happen. Then here in array factor, you get 1 plus e to the power of j, 0 plus e to the power of j, 2, 0, and so on. And e to the power of j, 0 is 1, so 1 plus 1. And then you get all the way to the end, and you have n terms, so it's going to be n times 1, which is n. So that's the maximum of array factor if you have psi equals 0. And psi equals 0 means 
you essentially have uh, elements that are added in phase. So although the distance might be different between them, so KD cos theta is the distance. But remember, you have an electric phase beta can, that can always compensate for that. So that's the situation with psi. Now let's check the same thing here. If psi goes to zero, if psi goes to zero, then remember if you have sine of x, when x goes to zero, sine of x is going to x, so to the argument. So I can just write, because psi goes to zero, argument goes to zero, that's going to be equal to, and psi divided by two, it's argument, divided by the argument of this one when psi goes to zero. So this is under psi goes to zero. Then psi divided by two, psi divided by two cancel, and you get your n, which is the maximum of the array factor. So if, it's that, if, if that, is that the only case that it can happen? The answer is, of course, no, because let's assume that psi is 2 pi. The same thing with 2 pi, because 2 pi is the same as zero. So phase of zero and phase of two pi, they're the same thing, zero and 360. Or four pi or six pi. So any two pi uh, segments would, would be the same thing. So if I substitute psi equal two pi, uh, still I get n. And if I go here and this time say psi goes to two pi, then again, because sine essentially goes to zero, you can, you can, Look at, for example, here, sine of 2 pi divided by 2 is sine of pi, which goes to 0. So you can replace the sine with its argument, and you still get your value n. So that essentially tells me that the maximum of the array factor is equal to n, and that happens when all the elements add up in phase. So that means psi is 0, or 2 pi, or 4 pi, or 6 pi, and so on. So that's my maximum of array factor. So this is important because, for example, in an antenna system, maybe you want to direct your main beam toward, for example, 30 degree. So main beam toward 30 degree, you want to you wanna, you wanna have your array factor such that they add up in phase at 30 degree uh, from the z axis, theta equal 30 degree. And we're gonna see that. So this is important that to make sure that this sign gives you in phase component when you are at theta equal 30. Now this was about maximum and let, now let's talk about nulls too. So Sometimes you don't want to receive some uh, signal from a certain direction. So you want to have essentially nulls in a certain direction. So how can we make sure that array factor gives us that null? So we need to equate it to zero. So if this is my array factor and I want to equate it to zero, remember that to equate this to zero, you want numerator to be zero, so psi n psi divided by two should be zero. And if you remember, for a sign to be equal to zero, its argument should be equal to n pi, where n is zero plus minus one plus minus two plus minus three and so on. So this is the condition for having for having nulls. So you want the numerator to be zero. But there is one thing you need to be aware here that if you want numerator to be zero, it doesn't necessarily mean nulls because if this goes to zero and at the same time denominator goes to zero, then you might not have a null. In fact, we just showed that it becomes a maximum. Remember, if psi goes to zero, for example, let's assume n is equal zero. Then psi essentially goes to zero. If psi goes to zero, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and the result becomes n, capital N, and that's our maximum. So, so US, I should rephrase myself to say to have nulls, 
you want numerator to go to zero, but denominator shouldn't go to zero, must not go to zero. So this is the modification that I need to have. Uh, by the way, something that it might confuse you and say, okay, how come numerator goes to zero and denominator goes to zero and I get maximum? This is based on math. It might be difficult to, to explain it intuitively, but based on, based on physics here, that's very easy to justify because if psi goes to zero, that means all the elements adds up in phase because psi is phase and therefore you essentially you essentially end up with the maximum. Now, in this case now, in this case what we have is that if you want null, you essentially have your sine n psi divided by two to zero. So this is the condition you get, but you just need to make sure that this term doesn't go to zero. Now, if I don't want psi divided by two goes to zero, then I need to avoid some of the n. So the n's that I need to avoid of course, is that n shouldn't be zero because if n is zero, psi becomes zero, this becomes zero too. Now, what about, for example, other things? For example, n cannot be, a small n cannot be plus minus capital N because if it, became, if, I, if it becomes plus minus capital N, then what's gonna happen? This capital N here, with this capital N cancel, and then psi divided by two goes to pi, if psi divided by two goes to pi, then the denominator also goes to zero. So that's gonna give you again uh, a maximum and then plus minus two n and so on. So you essentially want your n to be this number, but not this, this number. So you need to, for example, remove this one here. And if you have later on plus minus n, you also need to remove that to get to your nulls here. So this is essentially uh, what we have for nulls. Uh, because this is important, I wanna mention it one more time. You see, the reason that psi equals zero gives you in phase summation is that if psi is equal zero, look at this same, it is e to the power of j psi. So the, the second element has a phase of zero. The, the third element the, in terms of phase is two psi, but two times zero is also zero and so on. So all of them have the same phase. Now let's go with a different one. Let's say psi is two pi, because two pi is also gives, should give you in phase. Now let's see what's happening. The, phase, the first term, the first antenna has a phase of zero. The second antenna has a phase of two pi. And we know that two pi and zero are the same thing. So these are in phase. The third antenna has two times psi, so two times two pi becomes four pi, but four pi, two pi, and zero are the same thing. So as you see, if psi is zero, two pi, four pi, six pi, all of them have the same phase because two pi is the same thing as four pi. Four pi is the same thing as, as eight pi. So that's why this is gonna give you in phase for all the terms. So, so what we learned so far is that maximum of array factor is capital N, and this is the mechanism to find nulls of an antenna array. So now we're gonna continue with a few important parts of antenna array type, and then we're gonna talk about broadside array, and fire array, and phase array. Okay, let's start the one antenna array type, which is called broadside array. So this is going to be our broadside array, and we should see what it means. So if I want to say what it means, I should, uh, I mean, per perhaps I could show this antenna array. So as you see, these are these antenna elements on a, on a line. So let's assume this is Z axis. So they are located on the Z axis. So broadside essentially means the maximum the maximum radiation happens perpendicular to the antenna so if this is your antenna array along this line so perpendicular essentially means in the azimuth plane because this is toward u is perpendicular this way is perpendicular so any any direction on the azimuth plane is perpendicular and as you need azimuth plane is my xy plane and in a spherical coordinate that's theta equal 90 because if this is z if I rotate my finger 90 degree, 
it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, and so on. So the whole plane is essentially azimuth plane. So when you think of theta equal 90, don't think about one direction, it's the whole plane. So essentially, if I am the antenna array here, so my body is uh, antenna array, so my body is z-axis, essentially I'm covering the whole azimuth plane. So it's like, a, it's very good for coverage in the azimuth plane. So this is essentially broadside array. And this is the question that I want to ask you. Under what condition I'm going to get a broadside array? And in this particular one, we are not discussing particular antennas in conjunction with the array. We just want to see for what kind of excitation beta our array factor has the main beam direction toward a broadside, which is theta equal 90. So let me say broadside, if I'm assuming that um, this is Z axis, so this is my X and Y. So broadside essentially means theta equal 90. So if these are my, this is my array, so you're essentially perpendicular to the antenna array. So that's your theta equal 90. So essentially I want the maximum of array factor to happen at theta equal 90 degrees, and this is called broad side. So, uh, so this is essentially the question that I have, and I want to see under what condition that can happen. So let's let's figure it out together. Okay. So what we learned is that. Perhaps the simplest way of achieving uh, maximum array factor is to have in uh, is to make sure that psi is equal zero. Because if psi is equal zero, let's see what's going to happen. So if psi is equal zero, uh, I'm going to have e to the power of j psi, e to the power of j zero, e to the power of j zero, e to the power of j zero, and so on. So if I want to have all the elements in phase, I could go psi equal zero. So I can say, okay, I want psi to be equal to zero. At what angle? At cos theta, and I'm gonna substitute cos 90 plus beta. So this is what I'm gonna have. So if you have something like that, then what's gonna happen is that cos of 90 is zero. So you get zero here. So you're going to have 0 is equal 0 plus beta. And that essentially means beta is going to be equal to 0. So this essentially tells us that to have broadside antenna array, when you are exciting all of these elements, if you want to have broadside uh, and array factor, essentially you need to make sure that you excite all of them with the same phase. So that's going to be very important if you excite them with the, uh, you need to excite them with the same phase. Otherwise, they won't be, uh, it won't be broadside. And you can understand that from geometry too, because if I want to, if I want to perform a geometrical representation for you, Remember, if you have here, and this is the second element here, and if you look at the observation point, if you want to see what sort of phase difference you get because of different location geometry, this line here is going to be approximated by this minus this much. And this much is essentially the projection on this R line. So this line here would be this longer one minus that. So that's why you get a phase due to distance and then to have in phaseness you need to compensate that with the electric phase but if your observation point is at theta equal 90 because right now this is the theta of your observation point if your observation point is at theta equal 90 you get a different situation so let me have this here so let's have for example this antenna and this antenna again and this is your observation point here. So this is my observation point. So this is one distance, and this is the other distance. Now, this is a bit different than this. And remember, these points are in the far field, so they're very far. So it's it's uh, it's not 
I mean, if I if I could go longer, it would be uh, demonstrated better. But now think of the same concept, this projection. How can you project this and this? So, I mean, in terms of projection, you don't get anything when the observation point here. It's different than when the observation point is angled. So, in this situation, we essentially, this distance R, and let's call this R2, are treated the same. So, whereas in this case, you, when you are comparing these two distances in the far field, you need to take into account this a small portion from here, to here, which is the projection. Whereas when theta is equal 90, so this is my theta equal 90 for broadside, the distances are assumed to be the same because there is no projection in this case. Therefore, essentially you don't get any phase change due to distance. Therefore, you don't need any phase change electrically. That's why beta is zero. And beta is zero, is zero is meaningless here. here. Because zero essentially means they're all in phase. So whatever phase one has, the other one should have the same phase two. So that means all the elements are in phase. We say beta is equal to zero in this case. So that's my broad side uh, antenna array. But there is another issue here. Because when you say I want a broad side array, you want maximum to happen at theta equal 90. But what if maximum happens at theta equal 90, but you have another maximum, let's say somewhere else, at theta equal 60, for example. This is bad because you want the energy goes mainly in theta equal 90. If you have another maximum in theta equal 60, that's not good. You're wasting the energy in a different direction. For example, let's assume uh, uh, for uh, you're making something for uh, to cover an area in the azimuth plane. Now, all of a sudden, if you have a maximum going in theta equal 30 or even theta equal zero toward the ceiling, that's essentially uh, the loss of power for you because there is no user in that direction. So I should rephrase myself and say, I want a broadside array with maximum only at theta equal 90 because other maximum would be essentially undesired maximum for me. And these undesired maximum, we have a name for them in the antenna array, and this is called grating law. So these are essentially the maximum that we get that we don't want. For example, in broadside array, theta equal 90 is the desired maximum. This is our main beam direction. If you all of a sudden get another maximum at theta equal, for example, zero, that's the grating globe for you. So we want to avoid grating globes as well. So how can I do that? So under what condition you get other maximum? Remember, psi is zero is not the only condition to have maximum of array factor. Psi could be, for example, 2 pi. Psi could be 4 pi. Psi could be 6 pi, and so on. So in general, if psi is, let's say, I call it, uh, maybe, let's call it be 2, 2 n pi. So it could be 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, and n can be negative to minus 2 pi, minus 4 pi, and so on. This is going to give me maximum of the array factor. But I've already chosen my beta to be 0. So let's have my beta equal 0 here. So this is kd cos theta plus beta. But let's say I've already set my beta equal to 0 because I know I'm going to have a maximum at theta equal 90. So beta is already set to be 0. Now this is the question. Can I have another theta angle that can satisfy this equation? If I can have anything other than theta equal 90, then I get a grating globe. Remember, if theta equal 90, this becomes 0. 0 plus 0 becomes 0. So this is satisfied for n equals 0. So this is already satisfied, which is good. But are there any other angles? Let's find out. So then I can just say 2n pi is equal to, instead of k, I say 2 pi divided by lambda d cos theta. Again, I'm emphasizing that d by itself is meaningless, d compared to wavelengths. So 2 pi and 2 pi cancel. So cos theta becomes n lambda divided by d. This is the cos theta that I get. 
Now, now the question is, does it have an answer? Of course it has an answer. But let's, let's for example, let's uh, figure out one example. So let's assume lambda is d. If my lambda is d, then cos theta becomes n. And n could be 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 and so on. If n is 0, then you get theta equal 90, which is the one that you want. And, and at this point, you might say, OK, Puyan, why don't you write another theta? For example, theta equal 270. Uh, the reason is in a spherical coordinate, theta goes from 0 to 180. So I'm not going to go to 270 for this one. Then what about n equal 1? If n becomes 1, then cos of theta becomes 1, then theta is 0. n could be minus 1, then theta becomes pi. So you see here that this is the lobe that I wanted. This is for broadside. But these are becomes grating lobes for me. So that's essentially what's what's happening. Now, if you assume, if you assume that, for example, d is two lambda, the situation can get even worse because now I cannot continue to go to n equal two. There is no solution. But now I, I leave it to you that to try it for d equal two lambda to see you're gonna get even more grating lobes here. So this is the stuff that I need to. Uh, avoid. I don't want them. Now, how do you avoid them? If you look at this equation, under what condition you can make sure that this does not have any other solution than this solution that this is desired for us? So to make sure that there is no solution, there is one easy way. If you say separation between the elements should be a smaller than wavelengths. Because if d is smaller than lambda, then what happens is that n equals 0 is always satisfies. You get always cos 90, 0. But when you go, for example, to n equal 1, it's going to be 1 multiplied a number which is greater than 1. So cos of theta becomes greater than 1, and there is no solution. So if you make sure that d is smaller than lambda, you essentially get no grating lobe. So that becomes your only solution. So for me to summarize this, so if I want to have a broadside array, then beta, the phase difference between the element is zero. So I shouldn't have any phase difference. And also I want the separation between the elements to be less than wavelengths, because if that satisfies, then I don't get any grating lobes. Thank you very much.